So we're going we're gonna to pray and we're going to look at, um, we're going to have a, just a, a study of the, the narrative of the life of Philip in the book of Acts. It's going to be a little bit different, but I hope that there are some things that we can discover and uncover together as we study God's word. So let's come before him in prayer. Lord, we're so grateful that you are Lord of all. You're Lord of this day. You're Lord of this crazy morning. You're Lord of the technology that sometimes confounds us. We're so grateful that, um, that, that you, are, you are here. You're present in this room, and you speak through your word. And so speak now, because we want to hear what you have to say to us. Help us to see things on these, on these pages that would just um, convict, inspire, encourage to, to follow after you. Lead our time of study now, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, to begin, we're going to start in Caesarea. And that might not make sense until the, the end. So have you ever watched, uh, seen a movie where maybe like the beginning scenario is kind of the, you kind of get tossed into the story halfway through, and then it all kind of makes sense at the end? I'm going to attempt to make that connection in Caesarea. So in Caesarea is where um, we actually began our tour of Israel a few years ago. Um, and it was an amazing experience. It was, it was one that you kind of had to adjust your mind to. So after a flight into Canada and staring at the ceiling of the Toronto airport for seven hours, you finally get on a plane that lands in Tel Aviv after, I don't know, 12, 13 hours of flight time. We land. We get in a tour bus, and now the, the airport in, in Israel is in uh, Tel Aviv, so it's kind of on the northern part. Well, you know, all the, all the good stuff's kind of down in the south part, so it takes a little bit to get there. So we, we made our initial stop in Caesarea. So we all get out of the bus, and we're excited. You know, this is great. We're in the Holy Land. And we stop at Caesarea, and, and, the, and you know, the tour guide's like, well, here we are. And it's like, where are we? <laughs> and, and you look around, and it's rocks. It's rocks. And then we learn, like, well, you know, Jesus really wasn't here. So, I mean, these aren't even holy rocks, right? <laughs> but it was, it was an interesting place. It was, built by, um, it was built by Herod, and there was amazing infrastructure there. There were, were roads, and there was a theater and there was um, the place where they do the, the horse race and aqueducts and this, all these amazing things. And it was all just kind of in ruins. I mean, it was, it's impressive. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the quality of the roads in a 2,000-year-old Roman city, <laughs> you know, it can't hold it. Or our roads here can't hold a candle to those roads. I don't know what they did to build those roads in Rome. But it, it, was, it was amazing. And yet everything that remained, the work of Herod's hands, laid in ruins. It was worn. It was, you know, half there, half gone. But something happened in that town that was the work of the Lord, and that work remains. And I hope to, to kind of discover and uncover that through the study of the life of Philip, a follower of Jesus. So if you turn to um, Acts chapter 6, it's where we first get introduced to this man named Philip. Last Sunday was actually uh, Pentecost Sunday, the, the seventh Sunday after Resurrection Sunday, when the promised gift of the Holy Spirit was poured upon the disciples and the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, it was, it's kind of like the birthday of the church. It's kind of a, kind of a, a great uh, time to recognize. Um, but as the church started to grow and continued to grow in Jerusalem, uh, there were some growing pains. There was some uh, cultural discrimination that could potentially cause f factions in, in the church. And so that's where we pick up in uh, chapter 6. And, and, and the apostles were recognizing what was going on, and, and they came up with, with a solution. So we'll pick up uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying... There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, 
It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. I'll pause there for just a second. I think that was important for the apostles to recognize and to do. And I think of like, I think of a hospital. And while a neurosurgeon could certainly sweep the floors and empty the trashes, if I'm in need of brain surgery, I, I'm not going to want the janitor behind the knife. You know what I mean? They understood their role and, and their responsibility was to the word of God and to prayer. And so they were seeking out uh, a certain number of, of, of men with certain qualifications that could complete this specific task. And in doing so, they, they prevented these the, the factions from forming in the church and the church um, kind of crumbling right away. So there, there was, um, there's, there's roles among equals here. Um, let's pick up back in verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Pro Procaris, Nick Anor, Timo, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And I'm grateful that Philip has such a simple name to say. <laughs> Whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is incredible. I mean, just this small, uh, you know, like, let's, let's assess the situation, think about and pray about what we might do, come up with a solution, and in just executing that plan, um, it says that the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Um, so of these men, I think we're probably most familiar with Stephen, who in the next chapter, we, we, um, you know, we hear about his testimony, we hear about his wonderful, wonderful sermon on the history of Israel, and uh, the importance of Messiah, Jesus, coming to save them from their sins. Um, we know that from this list, we know that Nicholas is from Antioch, and that's about it. We don't know much about the other men except for Philip, who kind of comes and goes and comes and goes throughout the book of Acts. And those are the, the narratives that I'm, I'm hoping to kind of look at, consider, and then uh, connect in Caesarea. So I want you to make uh, just a mental note of the criteria that the apostles said to look for in these men. He wanted, they wanted men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom may be appointed over this business. And I kind of took that as, as stewards. Like, you want responsible stewards who were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and had a good reputation. Now, these qualities are going to be essential in Philip's life as we continue to follow him through the book of Acts. Now, I just wanted to make a quick word about, about what we're going to be studying. I'm, I'm not propping Philip up as some kind of um, example that you need to follow. Why can't you be more like Philip? You know, the, the hero of Philip's life isn't Philip. The hero of Philip's life is Christ. We consider how God used, used this faithful man not to moralize his life, but to see and celebrate a life used by the Holy Spirit for his purposes. So, as they're faithfully, as, as Philip with his six friends, I would imagine they would have become friends serving every day in the ministry. We're, we're, we're serving the Lord, serving the people. We have this incident with, with Stephen. Um, accusations were made, and Stephen gave his defense, and as a result, he was stoned to death, the first martyr of the faith. And the, a whole chapter, um, the whole of chapter 7 talks about uh, Stephen's, um, Stephen's defense and, and the reasons for belief. And if you're looking for something to do this afternoon, I commend that to your reading. Um, but we're going to, for the sake of brevity and following Philip, we're going to skip ahead to chapter 8. And pick up in verse 1 where it says, Saul was consenting to his death. Now, this man named Saul, 
was, was, he was hunting. <laughs> he was looking, looking for these believers of Jesus who were, and from his perspective and in his mind, were trying to get people away from the true faith, right? So he was consenting to his death. Now at that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So all would include the six other faithful men and probably many more. Now, this is kind of a fulfillment of what Jesus commanded them. You remember, go into all the earth, right? Um, not just Jerusalem. They weren't just meant to be cloistered up in this one city. They were meant to go everywhere. And they were going to get everywhere. And it was going to be the purposes of God that was going to allow them to do that. So uh, six, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. That would include Philip in verse 5, who we learned. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes were with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So this is incredible. I mean, Philip, um, he wasn't an apostle. And obviously, he did miraculous works, um, the healings, and his his. Evangel uh, evangelism and the miracles which he, which he, which he did. He was, just, he was just a guy, right? I mean, he was a man full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. He, he was, what was our criteria again? A good reputation, and he was a faithful steward. And so whether he was in Jerusalem, whether he was in Samaria, he was going to do what he was going to do. He was going to do what the Lord told him to do. And so he does. And amazing things happen in Samaria of all places. Now, the, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't really get along. So, I mean, it was one of those things where it's like, well, the Jews aren't going to proselytize in Samaria. Um, why don't we go up there, right? Like, we can make a difference for Christ um, in Samaria. We can make a difference for Christ anywhere. Um, now, there is a bit of an episode that we're gonna, just going to Again, for the sake of brevity and time, skip over. So I'm just going to uh, kind of hustle down to verse 12 as a, as a summary of the things that, that Philip was able, that the Lord was able to do through Philip in Samaria. But they believed, when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. I think it's just interesting to, to consider that, especially with with our baptism event coming up, but in light of the next kind of episode that we read about in Philip's life. So there were sort of really good things going on in Samaria. In fact, so good that the apostles who remained in Jerusalem came to Samaria to check it out, right? They wanted to see what's going on in Samaria, right? There's all these great things going on in Samaria. But now when we pick back up with, um, when in Philip, with Philip in verse 26 of chapter 8, it's a bit of a head-scratcher because uh, verse 26 in Acts 8 says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then I love how Luke, the author of Acts, kind of added this information in case we didn't know, this is desert. So just imagine, just imagine what Philip might be thinking. All this good stuff going in Samaria. People getting saved. People are getting baptized. You know, miracles are happening. Um, this is incredible. And then the Lord tells you to leave it all and go into the middle of nowhere. Now, I wonder if Philip had moments where he's like, was that really the Lord? Did I really hear from the Lord to go to the middle of nowhere is this, you know, is it, is, it, is it gas? Is it bad indigestion? What is it? <laughs> but we have to remember that Philip was a man full of holy, the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So, of course, he knew. Of course, he knew. And now, it may not, may, have, may, may not have made sense on the outside looking in. Like, Philip, what are you doing? 
why are you why are you leaving us? Like there's some good stuff going on. Let's just like maybe we hang out in Samaria until Paul comes and then we can go on to the next town, right? But he was obedient. He was obedient to the call of the Lord. And so he went. Uh, verse 26 of or 27 of chapter 8. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Now we understand a little bit more of why the Lord told Philip to go into the desert. There was a man on a chariot coming home, going home from Jerusalem, reading his Bible. Now, this is exciting. I'm sure Philip's heart may have skipped a beat a little bit to realize what was going on and, and why he was there. Verse 29 says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man in the chariot said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth, in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So here's this, this Ethiopian eunuch, uh, really high in the administration of, of the queen of Ethiopia, reading from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, and wondering, what's this all about? And so he answered, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Now, there was, there was a, a, a belief that maybe Isaiah was writing this about himself. And, of course, this side of the cross, we know exactly who Isaiah was referencing. It was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Again, if you want some good reading material this afternoon, dive into Isaiah 53. I think Dom has shared before about how in in trips to Israel past, they'll have this passage in the Hebrew language and, and go up to Jewish people and ask them if they could read it. And as they start to read it, they say, oh, I, I can't read this. It's from, it's from your Bible. It's from the Christian Bible. And he's like, no, check the reference. It's from the prophet Isaiah, from your Old Testament, because it matches so closely with what happened to Jesus on the cross. Philip, in verse 35, it's, uh, then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. And I'm hoping that I can just open my mouth now and the Lord would just preach Jesus to you. But again, we see the faithfulness exercised in, in this man, in Philip, just opening his mouth, taking, taking a chance, right? Seizing an opportunity, noticing this man reading the book of Isaiah and then just opening his mouth and just telling him everything that he knew about Jesus from the scripture. So this man heard the word of God, read the word of God, heard the word of God, and then he was obedient to the word of God. In verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And I love Philip's answer. In verse 37, he says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Amazing, right? This man just read the word, had it, had it explained to him, was aware enough to see the water, and then obedient enough to say, you know what? Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. I want to be baptized. So he commanded the chariot to stand still in verse 38, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, when, the, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotas and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. This is one of those passages that's like, I, 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 don't, I can't explain it. I don't know. With gas prices today, I, I wish it was more common. But 
Philip was taken up in the spirit and somehow, some way, transported to this city, um, leaving this, this Ethiopian to rejoice. Like this amazing episode in his life. And now he gets to go back and, and, and tell the court, the royal court, you know, his, his co-workers, his family, the things that happened, the things that happened to him on this desert road in the middle of Gaza. And this man came and he like came out of nowhere and then he left out of nowhere and it was crazy. Um, but again, we see, we see the importance of that faithful life that Philip led and we see the importance of, of baptism. Now I know that, you know, again, it, it coincides really great because we've got that event coming up and we were just talking about baptism um, the other week. In fact, I know because I stole Dom notes, Dom's notes, so I have what he said about baptism. Baptism is that outward symbol of that inward work, a public proclamation of something that has already happened. If you remember last week, we talked about how on the cross, uh, Christ died and we died with him. And from the grave, just as Christ rose up again, we rose with him. So we are, if you are in Christ, you are in Christ. You died to sin and you rose to newness of life. It's a beautiful and a powerful symbol um, that we see in the waters of baptism. Going down, symbolizing when we die. And coming up again, that symbol of Christ rising from the dead. This then becomes the identity of the believer. Right? It, the the, Ethiop the the status of the Ethiopian eunuch, like Ethiopian was like, you know, down the list. Now it was child of God. It was child of God first, foremost, and forever. And, you know, Ethiopian might come down, <laughs> down a bit later. But first, foremost, and forever, he was a child of God through the waters of baptism. So we've seen how Philip um, had has kind of been all over the map, literally. <laughs> he started in, in Jerusalem, went to Samaria as a result of, of Paul's breathing threats, uh, ends up in Gaza, and now he's, he was sent to Astros and then um, preached in the cities all the way until he came to Caesarea, where we begin. So in Caesarea, we learn a little bit about his life when his life and the life of Paul intersect. Now, um, Caesarea was an important, it was an important town, and, and I didn't mean to make, the, make light of the fact that it was just rocks. <laughs> um, uh, it was an important town for, for Paul. It was kind of the place where he would start off for his missionary journeys. It was a place he spent time before he was brought to Antioch. It would have been a place he would have been familiar with. Now, I'm not quite sure um, when or where Philip and, and Paul may have crossed uh, paths. I'm not sure if, if maybe Philip heard that Paul, formerly Saul, was coming to um, Caesarea and decided to take a vacation somewhere else for the weekend. I don't know. But I think there's an important episode, uh, the next episode that we'll consider in Acts 21. Now, this is Paul's on his way to, um, he's on his way to what he knows and everyone else is knowing is coming for him. I mean, they, there were prophets along the way saying, you're going to get captured. You're going to get arrested. Don't do it. It's not worth it. We need you, Paul. And Paul knew his mission because he was also a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. So they're on their way, and we'll pick up with, with um, Paul's journey in Acts 21, uh, verse 5. And he had, he had a bit of an entourage with him. So when it was time to leave, Verse 5 says, We left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. And after saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemas, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea, and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. I think that's just a beautiful like, epilogue of, 
of the life of Philip. Here we have him in a house. You know, he's settled down. He has four daughters. He raised a family. I think oftentimes we, we hear about, um, you know, Paul, the itinerant preacher, going from place to place to place. Uh, and, and sometimes we have that, that passion, like, oh, I was, I was listening to the radio about this man who was driving this ox car on this, um, I don't know, like ancient path between Canada and, and the upper Midwest. And I just thought it was great because um, they kind of framed it in a way that made it sound like, oh, you know, it's a weird hobby, but whatever. But um, his daughter's traveling with him, and they played a segment, you know, she would play worship music as, as he was traveling, and he would say, like, ah, I'm just, you know, as I'm walking the ox, I'm praying, and I meet with people, and I pray with them. And it's like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a cool life. Like, I wonder if I could sell everything and make myself an ox car and do that. That would be pretty. But the work of the Lord is, that's just as important and impactful as raising a family, as, as sharing Jesus with your coworkers, as living life with believers. Um, there's nothing to be said that could be taken away from Philip for the path of his life, and it was no better or worse than the path of Paul's life. And here he is with a house in Caesarea and four married daughters, and I just wonder what that interaction might have been like. Can you imagine Philip sitting across that table and seeing Paul and maybe being like, do you know who I am? <laughs> I just, I don't know, for whatever reason, the line from uh, the Princess Bride came up, hello, my name is Philip the Evangelist. You killed my brother in Christ. <laughs> but no, no. Revenge wasn't on his mind or his heart. I think he may have thought of, of what, um, what Joseph's brothers did to Joseph. And he may have, he may have, may have shared, and again, this is a bit of a speculation, but I just wonder if it's like, Paul, you know, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Look, because of what happened, as, as sad as that was, because I lost a friend in the ministry, I went to Samaria, and people were saved. I met this Ethiopian, and he was saved. I started a family, and I have four daughters who prophesied. This is amazing, Paul. Isn't God's grace amazing? I think there was, there was shalom between them. There was that peace. There was that peace. And so here, I just think it's interesting. At this, this maritime village uh, on the Mediterranean, you have, you have these two weathered sailors of the ocean of God's grace. We've been talking about that a lot, haven't we? I think, you know, there was a time where Paul then Saul was so consumed with how much sin was in everyone's thimbles with his back turned to that ocean of grace. And once he made that turn and he realized just how vast and enormous God's grace is, it, he couldn't but help to go out and tell others about him. And you have Philip, who demonstrated time and time again that grace. You know, it would have been easy for him. It would have been so easy for him to have bitterness and revenge, and maybe rage against Paul in his heart. But he knew God's grace. He knew that ocean too. And he chose to live at peace with his brother. And so with that being said, I think, I just think of, of, the way those two characters, the way these two men, great men of faith, had that intersection, um, just that episode, that, that, that vision of them sitting across from one another, maybe swapping stories of the amazing things that the Holy Spirit was able to do through them. Uh, wow, it just, it's what a, great, what a great lesson that we can learn. So um, let's pray to close our time and study. Lord, so grateful for that ocean of grace that, um, that brings us refreshment and that helps us, helps us to see you better. Lord, when I consider just this past week, I'm sure that there are, I gave you ample opportunities to just send a lightning bolt, but in your grace and in your mercy, uh, you showed me kindness, and we know, Lord, it's your, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. 
Thank you for being so faithful to us, so merciful, so gracious to us. Thank you for showing us these uh, examples in the lives of, of real people in your word. Help us to help us to, to have that same mindset as maybe we struggle with bitterness or, or deal with some issues in our life that, um, that we need to work on, that we need your help with, that we need your grace for. So minister to our hearts as we sing to you with this last song and go before the rest of our day today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.